What conspiracy theory do you completely believe is true? Story 1. A lot of entertainment companies are money laundering fronts. Someone said that paintings sold for millions, and I thought, oh god, yeah, why didn't I think that before? Not just that, but horses. You would be amazed how race horses and show horses are used to move money or avoid taxes. Edit. A lot of people are asking how this is done, and from what I've seen, it works on the arbitrary price model of high dollar horses. Some people will buy high and sell low under a common umbrella as their other businesses to report less taxable profit. Usually these transactions are fast. Buy a high-end show horse, own it for a month, and sell it for half of the purchase price. If anyone asks, you can report behavioral issues or other reasons to sell low. There are a lot of other odd transactions that happen. Google Caroline Rothman. She has been involved in some interesting cases. As someone who spent eight years in art school, it's the only way to make sense of what is an insane insanely illogical art market. Ace Gallery in LA, one of the biggest galleries in the 80s and 90s, was notorious for selling paintings two or three times, stiffing the artist and not delivering the art to anyone. There's no way art is worth that much. Story 2. Epstein didn't kill himself. I'm on the middle ground in this one. I think he did kill himself, but only when someone visited his cell and told him to either do it himself or, you know, suffer much worse consequences. Of course, during that visit, the cameras mysteriously turned off and both guards decided to take a nap. Okay, I'll be the one. I see no reason to think that Epstein was murdered. I see no evidence that he was coerced into suicide. The dude was a psychopath. He knew he was done for and offed himself to avoid prosecution. His only power, blackmailing the wealthy, relied on him having access to information and resources that were either destroyed in the FBI's hands or inaccessible to him. I think a guy who decides to kill himself will exploit inevitable mistakes in the system trying to prevent it, and he'll succeed eventually. Go ahead, anyone. Give me well-resourced concrete proof that he was either murdered or compelled to kill himself, not questions that are unanswered. My response will always be the null hypothesis and Occam's razor. I'll wait. If Epstein did kill himself on his very own whim, without help from outside influence or shadowy figures commanding him to do it, it would be very hard. When you are on a 5150, everything that has the potential to be able to kill you is taken away. Shoelaces, strings, unbelts, clothes that can support your weight, beds, and other furniture have nothing to tie off to, and you are supposed to be under 24-7 surveillance. How is it that Epstein was able to secure any object to hang himself or strangle himself with. Who decided it was a good idea to take him off suicide watch and stick him in a cell with no operational cameras? Why were the guards not doing constant wellness checks on him? Regardless if he actually convinced the staff he was no longer suicidal, he's the most high-profile convict in the entire world. It was already a meme that he was going to be suicidal in jail when he was first incarcerated. The amount of gross negligence that allowed Epstein to kill himself is super suspicious. Whether he did it or not, I don't think we'll ever know. Story 3. Maybe not Tupac, but at least one celebrity has faked their death and is still out there. Funny enough, the other day some photos went around showing Tupac in art school as a teenager. One picture of him being in ballet class. I have to be honest with you, my mind went on a little vacation and I thought to myself, it makes perfect sense. Tupac was never really a gangster, but instead a brilliant thespian who created a character he just didn't want to play anymore, and faked his death to retire the character and start a new one. Then I got to thinking, what what if the whole 90s gangster rap saga was all theater, and some of the other rappers that got shot did the same? Like maybe Biggie and Tupac fell in love, and they knew they couldn't make it work with American culture, so they retired their characters, and now run a small theater company in Brazil somewhere. I like to think it was Jim Morrison. That picture of him in a preppy pink shirt with a sweater tied around his shoulders got taken, and he was like, well, can't live this down. Then he disappeared into Paris and moved to England. Considering how many people fake their deaths all the time, it's got to be likely for at least one celeb to have done it. Story 4. 
Not a specific theory, but I have no doubt that the majority of leaks for the entertainment industry, video games, movies, TV, etc., are completely purposeful and meant to gauge general opinions before official announcements. Have worked in the gaming industry at large companies for almost 20 years. Nine times out of ten, leaks were caused by stupidity or lack of awareness, unfortunately. They are actually far more common than you would think, too. They are just corrected before anyone realizes this due to people being caught and not wanting to further risk their job or get nasty calls from lawyers. This happens in the automotive industry as well. Most spy shots and leaks are allowed to happen, if not orchestrated by the marketing department to build anticipation for the new models coming out. I mean, to think that marketing teams make use of leaks isn't really much of a conspiracy theory. Story 5 Shelley Miscavige is either dead or being held prisoner by the Church of Scientology. Not only did the cops out Leah R. for filing the missing persons case, but they also stated that they talked to her in person and closed the case as not missing. Like, isn't it questionable at all that someone hasn't been in public since 2007 and someone files a missing persons case and the Church of Scientology calls up and is like, nope, she's not missing, here she is. Okay, leave us now, she needs to go back inside. And then the cops are just like, okay, yep, she's fine. While well, the likelihood of the cops being in their pockets aside, this is the trickiest part of dismantling cults in general. They cover it in the Scientology documentary HBO did. People are documented as being held in these compounds and absolutely tortured, but the fact is that even if the cops raided them while they were being tortured, the people themselves would say that they are adults and that they're there on their own free will. We haven't seen any proof of her alive, so I doubt we'll ever see her again. Story 6 I got a pretty harmless one. Stevie Wonder can see. The world's elites are in on it, which almost got blown open when George W. Bush waved at him. After hearing this story, I looked into it a bit and found out that most blind people aren't 100% blind, so he can probably see vague shapes, light, and motion. When he saw Shaq on an elevator, he probably just saw the iconic massive silhouette of Shaquille O'Neal lumbering towards him, all blurry, and knew who it was. Yeah, I remember in middle school, a blind lady came in to talk to us about being blind and it was really enlightening. She could tell when the lights were on or off and she could tell when someone walked in front of her. She said most blind people can tell between a light and dark room and that something like 40% of blind people can tell the difference between Shaq and Hakeem Olajuwon. Now that's a conspiracy I can get behind. Story 7 I'm in the Navy and we change uniforms a lot compared to other branches. There's a conspiracy theory that there's a rear admiral whose wife has stocks in the company that makes our uniform. I just randomly heard someone talking about it. I have zero evidence that it's true, but I 100% believe it. You're likely right. The military is the human centipede of nepotism spending. If private companies want to make any money off of the military, you better hire influential ex-military. I worked for one of these companies. We supplied software for Navy aircraft systems. They spent millions on this software. The company that was providing the software was run by an ex-high-ranking Navy man, Puppet CEO. The software was the exact same as they had already had and owned intellectual rights to, an older version. By the time this crappy run company provided the Navy with the newly copied version of the software, the tech stack was already so outdated and the original software vendor had better versions. I was told it was over 100 million spent. This for something they already had. The actual story of how that came to be leaked, and is one of my all-time fave stories of the military of all time. So here we go. Keep in mind, this all happened. So 2001 rolls around, and the army decides they need new camo patterns for the new war on terror, and mostly because the money is there to do it. So they start their research and development teams. A few years down the road in 2003, the marines pushed out their new digital camo patterns. The army general in charge of R&D sees it and goes, we need some something cool and tech looking like that. We can't be outdone by the Marines. He takes one of the designers with him to Lowe's Home Improvement, points at three colors and says, do that tech camo stuff in that color. The development team obviously fights about it, but in the end he gets his way and we have UCP. Years later, we realize this camo is crap. We need something that actually works well and helps our troops blend in rather than stick out like a sore thumb. Around 2010, Cry came to the DOD with their new multicam pattern 
pattern. It's a hit. It wins everything across the board and it gets pushed out. Because of how it works, the DoD and any company using multicam has to lease the camo from Cry for billions of dollars. A few years later, sometime in 2014, Private Joe Snuffy is going through documents at the Pentagon when he sees something odd. The multicam pattern. But it wasn't called multicam, it was called Scorpion and was developed by the Army in 2001. Turns out, while multiple companies made different camos, the Army made just one, Scorpion. It was developed back in 2001 for the R&D to be selected, but was turned away for UCP. Seeing its effectiveness, Cry took Scorpion, changed the hue slightly, then remarketed it as multicam, and sold the Army back its own camo for billions, which it already spent millions on creating. Corruption? More likely than not. Usually isn't a conspiracy. Story 8. The government was behind hashtag throwback Thursday in order to get us to digitize and upload pictures that they would not have had access to in order to help improve age progression slash facial recognition algorithms. On a similar note, sometime around 2010, a law was passed that said all Wi-Fi signals are legal to intercept slash eavesdrop on if you can pick them up from a public area, just like taking photographs in a public place is legal. I don't think it was even a year later that ISPs around the nation started rolling out free Wi-Fi across all the major metropolitan areas. You would be able to log into any of these hotspots as long as you were a subscriber of the local ISP. They claimed there would be apps that would let you get coupons for nearby stores, etc. But equipment costs money, and so does the labor to put up that equipment. And it doesn't take a genius to deduce that a large part of those costs were probably underwritten by the government, especially when barely anyone used those hotspots, and apps like that weren't created until a decade later. The reality of it, I'm sure, is that all these hotspots are potential listening devices. Also, a lot of people don't know that any email left on a server longer than six months is considered abandoned, even if you log in to check your email daily and is able to be gathered at will. I think there are two possibilities that may be likely to explain this. Possibility one, the government identified their plans to roll out free Wi-Fi and decided to act. Many government officials have an unfounded fear of the idea of freedom of information for the public, so you can imagine if the ISPs had put in any sort of patents, requests, planning, information, or whatever could be used to garner that information, the government may feel a need to step in and impose a level of control over it. Possibility 2, ISPs identified a loophole in the law that allows them to collect and or sell people's information freely, so they jumped on the chance to make some extra money, which would account for the cost of setting it up in the first place. Somehow, the idea of the ISP setting up a mass-scale data collector for the government seems unlikely to me. Assuming Assuming it wasn't a coincidence, individual greed or fear are far more powerful motivators. It could also be the tech companies trying to gather data instead of the government. Story 9 I believe conspiracy theories are the ultimate conspiracy. They send the message that there is some invisible hand controlling things, meaning there is nothing you can do to change it. They instill complacency. As George Carlin said, you don't need a formal conspiracy when interests converge. That's all a conspiracy is. Multiple people deciding on something that benefits them that no one knows about, unless I've got that way wrong. I think when people have as much power as they have, and we know vast wealth means power, then they'll exercise their power. If they they don't, it means they never did. But they wouldn't be in the position they are in if they didn't. So one follows the other. Like what is power except this abstract thing that can only be measured when you wield it, if that makes sense. You can't be powerful, can't feel powerful unless you act on it. Also, some conspiracy theories are planted in order to deflect attention from the real conspiracy. For example, water fluoridation. We always hear of the nutcases talking about a communist conspiracy to pollute our precious bodily fluids and other claptrap. But we never question why putting it in our drinking water is the best way to deliver the correct dosage to children. Some kids drink a lot of tap water. Others don't drink any. Meanwhile, your turds are being fluoridated as they go down the bowl. Your car when you wash it, your clothes, your lawn, all are getting dosed with fluoride, which is a byproduct of the soft drink industry and a hazardous material that would be expensive to dispose of. Not saying it isn't good for your teeth, however, although it's funny to note that while tooth decay has declined dramatically since it became widespread, spread, there has been a parallel decline in tooth decay in countries that don't use fluoridated water. I don't know. I'm focusing on this one conspiracy theory of my own, but my main point is to say that silly ridiculous conspiracy theories are often promoted in order to discredit legitimate questions. That's a really interesting way to look at it. Story 10. 
Brittany is the highest profile Disney victim we might probably ever know about. Her mental breaks were the result of sexual and physical abuse from her handlers, her parents, and the people she worked with at Disney. The conservatorship that she's been trying to get lifted is one designed to keep her silent because the momentum of the hashtag MeToo movement, as well as the high profile cases against Hollywood folks, will result in a huge financial hit to Disney. If we hear that Britney couldn't take it anymore and killed herself, it's most likely the result of everyone in her life trying to control and manipulate her and they will likely kill her under the guise of a suicide. Reminds me of that story about one song that she gave to that radio station one night. She came uninvited, bare feet, and did a Q&A about her new album. Then suddenly the album never happened. The lyrics to the song that they played on the radio got changed to the point where it sounded like she was crying for help or something. It was kind of creepy to me. Also, that she was forced to do that baby voice by Disney slash record execs. If you go to YouTube, you'll see clips and videos of her real register, which sounds a lot like Christina Aguilera. They wouldn't let her sing like that because Extina was also a Disney kid and bringing out an album at the same time. Plus, inventalizing her made more money because of weird sexual reasons. There's no way Britney didn't go through absolute trauma in her early career. Story 11. The U.S. military is a huge lobbyist behind not adopting socialized health care and college because those are the two main reasons that people join the military. With socialized health care and college, recruit numbers would plummet and we would no longer be the military powerhouse that we currently are. This sounds logical, but today's military doesn't thrive on having a ton of troops. In fact, we cut a lot of people pretty regularly because we have too many sometimes. I imagine that the military would actually love universal health care and college because it takes those enormous costs out of their budget altogether. No politician gets support when trying to cut military spending. Essentially, universal health care in college gives DOD leaders a ton of extra money to spend and waste on other stuff. So what's not to like? As a believer of the above theory, this actually is making me ponder about this. I do know that most of my military contacts joined just for the above benefits, but have also done budgets. The only issue I see is that staffing numbers are service-based and the benefits are federal and mostly non-enumerated. So the Marine Corps, for example, doesn't eat those costs while also benefiting from the greatly increased recruit pool. All I'm gonna say is that recruitment is higher among poorer segments of the population for a reason. Story 12. While the government listening to everyone's phone calls and reading our emails was once considered a conspiracy theory and we all know how that turned out, many years ago I walked into a Barnes & Noble and spotted a guy sitting alone at a card table near the entrance. The table stacked with books. We had a nice chat. He told me how he got started writing the book, his first. He was teaching at a prep school where the Secret Service showed up at 7am and banged on a dorm door. The student had emailed the night before. Word to the effect that someone should shoot the president. That got the author interested in the NSA and he wrote a novel about it. While researching the book, he was emailing various ex-NSA people to get background on the agency. One time, he emailed, should we be encrypting these emails? He received a reply stating, one, there isn't any encryption you could do that would hinder the NSA. Two, I'm not telling you anything I shouldn't. And three, the plutonium arrives on Thursday. Praise God. Dan Brown before he hit it big. That that wasn't a conspiracy theory, it was public knowledge. They literally had articles in major newspapers about the NSA building these big facilities back in the 2000s. People who acted like it was some grand revelation were just stupid. It's basically impossible to keep it a secret, and pretty much everyone knew about it who was paying any attention whatsoever. Though listening is inaccurate. It's more accurate to say that they try to grab as much information as possible so that they can go back through it later. It's why it's much easier to catch people after the fact than before. It. There's no way to comb through the data proactively. They can only follow persons of interest. Once they find one, they go back and figure out what was going on and then go get them. It takes multiple people to track one person, so it's obvious that they can't actually track everyone. Also, they weren't recording every phone call. They did get all of the metadata, but they couldn't do recordings of everything. I love seeing proven conspiracies. I'm not crazy, you are. Story 13. 
All that stupid stuff shared on Facebook is just a way for people to mine your information for forgotten passwords, resets, and stuff. Things like, bet no one remembers the street they grew up on, I'll wait. Or, what would your name be if you took your mom's name instead of your dad's? Thinking emoji. I don't have Facebook, but a friend is really into this stuff. Let's make a test altogether and let's check our overall compatibility. Yeah, Stacy, knowing the brand and model of my first car definitely tells you whether I'm a good friend. I even prefer poorly translated data mining tests. What was your mom's maiden name? Wake up. We're in a country in which women keep their maiden name. Just check her profile or her doorbell, and it is displayed beside her first name. Back in the days of MySpace, remember bulletins? It was basically like status updates on Facebook, but you could put a whole page up and people would comment, etc. Anyway, a big one that did the rounds was, what's your porn star name? It's the name of your first pet and mother's maiden name. Share your movie star names. And you know what? I 100% did it as did countless others. Looking back, it was probably a friend just copying off of someone else, so it was harmless enough. It originates from somewhere, though, and there will have been plenty of replies to it, like Rex Smith, without realizing what they just did. Data mining is super scary. Pretty much every major tech company relies on it. Story 14 the Lost Cosmonauts. I think it's absolutely possible that there were attempts by the Soviet Union to launch manned aircraft into space before Gagarin and that some of the cosmonauts died. This one is thoroughly debunked and not particularly plausible. The recordings were produced by a couple of Italian hoaxers, are in terribly translated Russian, and depict a crew of two when the USSR wasn't capable of sending two people into space at once. Also, any extra secret missions would be detectable by the West, who had plenty of radar and the ability to pick up any transmissions themselves. Would they have ignored the propaganda coup of revealing a Soviet failure? Look into the radio broadcast of the supposed first female cosmonaut. Back in the day when Sputnik was launched, some guys set up radio equipment in their shed and learned how to not only find Sputnik but also track it. They eventually came across a very unsettling broadcast from another craft they found where you can distinctly hear a female Russian voice calling for help from the base and explain explaining that there is a problem and she's getting very hot. So people speculate that the CCCP had sent a woman into space who perished and completely swept it under the rug. Soviet Russia did some insane stuff during the Cold War. Erasing one failed cosmonaut is not even remotely unbelievable. Story 15 Tommy Wiseau is D.B. Cooper. For those of you who don't know D.B. Cooper, he's a famous American thief aboard a plane flying from Seattle, Washington to Mexico City before the plane was over Reno, Nevada. D.B. Cooper robbed everyone on the plane, took all of the parachutes and jumped out of the plane and was never seen again. Nobody knew his name and he spoke with a strange accent. Tommy Wiseau showed up seemingly randomly with a ton of money, has been said to be older than he says he is and speaks with a strange accent. At one point, people People found a ton of money which was said to be DB's ransom money or stash, and the guy that they were investigating didn't look much like him, and the evidence was never convulsive, and the whole attempt was some History Channel BS. Tommy Wiseau, however, fits the bill. That sounds fun, but DB Cooper was said to be mid to late 40s in 1971. He'd be pushing 100 years old. I can see Tommy being in his 70s. He's allegedly 64. I think Tommy was just up to no good or got in trouble somewhere and changed his identity later. The ages just don't mesh for me. Cooper didn't steal from passengers. He told a flight attendant he had a bomb and demanded the plane land in Seattle. He said he wanted $200,000 and four parachutes brought to the plane upon landing, and a fuel truck waiting. They landed, the items were brought to the plane, it was refueled and took off again heading to Mexico. That's when Cooper bailed out. As for your conspiracy, $200,000 is not a ton of money, and no one who spoke to Cooper said he had a strange accent. I mean, that would be over a million today. Quite a bit of money. Story 16. Donald Trump did not want to be president. He just wanted publicity and to bitch about politics without actually having to do something about it. Also, he would not have to run at all if Obama hadn't roasted him at the state dinner. He only ran to undo pretty much all of Obama's policies in an effort to make him the least effective president ever. This one isn't a conspiracy. It was reported in tons of news media for years and still is mentioned in some books and articles. He wanted to run in order to get support for his own TV network. The 
the basis for this is because all his staff before winning the first primaries were entertainment staff and PR. After that, he fired everyone and got staff trained in politics and campaigning. I had a sneaking suspicion that it was one of those billionaire bets, similar to the movie Rat Race where John Cleese's character is making random, albeit funny, bets with other billionaires throughout the movie. Donald Trump was betting that he couldn't become president of the United States, and Trump being Trump figured there was nothing he can't do, so he put his hat in the race. Secretly, he didn't think he was going to win, and when he did, it was bittersweet. Yes, he won the bet and proved he's the man, but on the other hand, he now has a job title he knows he has no knowledge of, and is in way over his head. This is definitely possible. He looked shocked when he actually won. Story 17 in my home city in the UK, a heroin dealer was convicted of lacing his product with poison and causing the deaths of homeless people. In court, he claimed that the local council paid him to get rid of some of the homeless people in that way. His defense was, why would I kill my customers? I have met one person that worked with the council and believes the story to be true, and years later I met some people that had worked with a homeless charity at the time. They claimed they knew it was the case, but there was nothing they could do to prove it. I don't believe that at all. If it was even remotely true, someone would have talked. UK councils don't pay well, so after a short time, this would have become international news. It's one of those things which sounds good and definitely happened in another country, but when you run it through the BS checker, it sounds off the alarms. Would not like to be proven wrong for obvious reason. I guarantee it's true. Guarantee it. I was addicted to opiates hard for about eight years. I am three years clean as of 625. No heroin or pill dealer I know wants anything to do with crap they knew was laced. Most of the time, they're selling dope because they need the money. Why would they purposefully eliminate any of their money by killing their customers? They wouldn't. There was a wave of fake pressed Percocets in my area about a year before I got clean. Somehow, every dealer in the entire country had them. Each and every one of them I dealt with while trying to find real pills all told me up front and said that if I were to do them, to have another person with me in case I OD, as it's way more likely. Most of the time, they'd offer them at half the price, which is unheard of, since again, they need the money. That wouldn't even surprise me if it was true. Story 18 I hate to say this one because it's probably the most ridiculous, but I genuinely believe that the Trump family being time travelers is possible. The background behind the conspiracy is somewhat uncanny, and all the sources are incredibly legitimate, but I never hear about it. Pretty much, it starts with an author from the late 1800s, Ingersoll Lockwood, who wrote a handful of books. The first is a fantasy book called The Marvelous Adventures of Baron Trump, about a Baron Trump who was mentored by a Don. Baron and Don are technically titles in the book, but also the name of Trump and his youngest son. The book touches on some issues with power and vanity by leaders in power and creates a huge parallel between fantasy and generally crappy slash arrogant people. Not a lot of connection there except the names and essentially describing Trump and the fantasy characters. The other important book is the one that hits home. The Last President, by the exact same author, is about a wealthy man in New York who is elected president but he wasn't expected to and people are incredibly upset, rioting, etc., mostly over capitalists taking over the country. Chapter 1 literally opens up with riots overpowering police after an election on November 3rd, 1896, saying that the Fifth Avenue Hotel will be the first to feel the fury of the mob. Now, some connections beyond the obvious, November 3rd, 2020, happens to be election day this year. The Fifth Avenue Hotel mentioned in the book has been replaced by none other than Trump Tower. The secretary in the book is Lafay Pence. Coincidence, right? Well, fast forward a bit because in the 1940s before he died, Nikola Tesla had made tons of other invention claims like perfecting his death beam, progress in a time machine, etc. Also, during that time, the FBI had an office of alien property, like foreign, not UFOs, from which the assistant FBI director Foxworth had sent people to seize all of Tesla's research shortly after he died in hopes some of it may be useful. Well, after seizing it, they hired none other than Dr. John Trump, Donald Trump's uncle, to solely analyze all the paperwork under federal custody to keep privacy. Dr. Trump publicly claimed that the research was only speculative and did not include new, sound, workable principles or methods for realizing such results. The Tesla papers were never published, and after a few decades, the majority of his research was deemed lost by both the U.S. government and the Soviet Union, and what remains is 
somewhere in Yugoslavia, I believe at a museum. So essentially, the idea is that Trump's uncle discovered time travel through Tesla's research and hid slash copied what was valuable or dangerous to keep out of government control. Then he, Baron, or someone or all in the family has used it to create the wealth that the Trump family has. Theoretically, time travel may not work like we see in movies, so what they can accomplish could be limited to a few good choices and leaving their mark behind in these books. Now that's a conspiracy. Long, unbelievable, and believable at the same time. Story 19. Jelaine Maxwell was one of the most prolific posters on Reddit and had an account that was at the time the eighth highest karma in the history of the site. The account stopped posting the day that Maxwell was arrested and has had many notable posting absences that coincide with Maxwell's important life moments, notably her mother dying and the Reddit party that Ellen Powell mentioned seeing Ghislaine at. The account mentioned having a birthday in late December, after the 21st, while Maxwell's is given as the 25th. The account often posted regarding the legalization of child pornography and child protection laws, but never mentioned Epstein despite the political subs they moderated. While certain other mods have made claims that they are still in contact with the account, various other inconsistencies seem to invalidate that, such as them claiming that they were from a certain country but not knowing that country's national dish. Not mentioning too many specifics to prevent brigading, but you can find more info elsewhere. I check in on the account every couple of weeks, just in case they've posted posted anything. Still haven't. Of everything here, this seems the most likely to be true to me. She's the daughter of a publishing magnate. She hasn't got a job, and based on her dad, she'd know before most people just how influential social media would become. Very easy to see her just opening accounts early on, every social media site that she can find while sitting around all day, just in case one of those sites becomes the big one. I can see her getting lucky with getting her Reddit account early on, then worming her way in as a mod to loads of subreddits to try and guide the conversation on all sorts of topics. Ally that with the topics that the account posted about, and as you say, the topics it didn't post about, and I find this theory very believable. Thanks for watching to the end. If you have a similar story that you would like to share with us, please leave it down in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, please leave us a like and make sure to subscribe. For more videos like this one right now, please stop by our channel. Thanks again, and see you next time.